Good morning, everyone. We are in Malachim Perek Yudchet, Malachim Bet Perek Yudchet, and we're about to begin a new era of the Jewish people, an era of tremendous religious revival under Chizkiyahu HaMelech. Now, to remind everyone of a couple of basic facts and actually to do a little bit of back and forth between different sources, I sent you a lot of sources last night. Remember, that Yeshayahu, the Navi, served during the course of four kings. Uziyahu, who was his first cousin, Yotam, first cousin once removed, Achaz, and Chizkiyahu. So we are at the end, actually, of Yeshayahu's period of reign over the Jewish people, or not the, the prophecy over the Jewish people, Yeshayahu's very last prophecy is delivered approximately the year 701. Um, Chizkiyahu will reign for three years after that still. He reigns until 698 before the Common Era. But we are in the time of Yeshayahu. According to Chazal, despite the fact that Ahaz was an evil king, in many ways he far exceeded the evil of what had happened in the north, Chizkiyahu had been given to his cousin Yeshayahu as a student. And he had been studying with Yeshayahu at the behest of Yotam, of the grandfather, the king, the grandfather. In all of those pieces, Yeshayahu helped to raise, according to Chazal, one of the most righteous kings, in fact, a king who is identified as having been um, fit to have served as the Mashiach to bring up about the ultimate geula, the ultimate redemption. That's step number one. Understanding that piece and understanding what had happened regarding Ahaz himself, we also begin to see a very first step, which actually precedes this parak and goes back to Divrei Hayamim Bet, which I had mentioned to you earlier, and obviously a couple of prakim ago, where we talk about the death of Ahaz, Chizkiyahu's father. I get, sent you the handout, but you can also have it, in, obviously, in a regular Tanakh. In Divrei Hayamim Bet, chapter 28, Chavchet, the very last pasuk, it says, Vayishkav Ahaz imavotav, and they kept, they buried him in Yerushalayim. They didn't accord him a royal burial, placing him in the burial places of the Jewish people, the burial caves of the kings of the Jews. And his son, Yechizkiyahu, ruled in his stead. Now there is a um, a fascinating, relatively new commentary that was written to Sefer Yeshayahu and is published by, Ma by Magid, one of the, um, the imprints of Koran. It was co-written by Yoel bin Nun and bin Yamin Lau, both significant scholars, but Yoel bin Nun we've spoken about in the past. He was in the first machzor of uh, Yeshivat Haaretzion, actually he was one of the teachers actually in the first machzor of the first people who came in 1968. He still continues to teach Tanakh. He has some of the uh, more creative approaches uh, and is also one of the people credited with a lot of the new, new interest in the studying of Tanakh and the new ways we look at Tanakh as well. And Binyamin Lau is a very significant Rav and a, a scholar as well. He is first cousins to the cur current chief rabbi. His father was the ambassador um, um, and and uh, Binyamin Lau has written a lot on Tanakh. He's also, by the way, the founder of the 929 website, which has really done tremendous things in terms of uh, moving forward the regular study of Tanakh among people, Hamonam, among the, the general populace. If there's an English version of it that is available now as well. They did a, um, a commentary from Magid on the book of Yeshayahu. And in that commentary, and I sent you uh, a section of it from one of their chapters. 
and I'm going to bring it up on screen as well, just so we have it all. And we're looking at it very briefly. It's not the kind of thing that I'm going to read sentence by sentence with you. That this is, I guess, sent you a lot of background this time, but there is a lot of good information in it, and so it's worthwhile just looking at it very briefly as well. If you just give me one moment. Okay. Um, so, bringing up that sheet, <coughs> if um, you notice at the top of the left-hand side of the page, it's page 112. They mentioned that the, in the ten, among the Tanoim, there's already, and this is a, based on a, two Gemaras, based on the Tanoim, that there was a third explanation of what happens at the point of when Ahaz dies. And they described this uh, in a, a fascinating way and they, right around here, he talks about for 20 years, Chizkiyahu has been placed in the prophet's care. His grandfather had placed him under the prophet's care under his father's nose. And he had become one of Isaiah's greatest students. So Chizkiyahu HaMelech is not only Chizkiyahu HaMelech or the crown prince Chizkiyahu, he's also the Talmid Muvhak of Yeshayahu Hanavi. Unfortunately, if and just going over here to this sense, the bitter disappointment of Uziyahu's last days when things went bad, the prophet had not known a moment of joy. In other words, things just kept on spiraling out of control between the period of time, the, uh, the end of Uziyahu, Yotam was better, Achaz was worse, and now into Chizkiyahu's time. And in fact, he even notes at the end of the paragraph that Yeshayahu Navi was not a regular guest anymore. He had, had basically exiled himself from public positions because he was being ignored and also he was being pursued. On the next page, just quickly, it notice it talks about the burial itself, the right side of the page, that they were all prepared for the royal burial with everything going. And then the second paragraph, suddenly a voice proclaimed in the name of Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, placed the body on a bier of ropes. Now the Gemara talks about this, that he dragged his father's bones on a rope bier, on a shel chavalim, um, and everyone was trying to figure out what was going on. The next paragraph, no one questioned Chizkiyahu, but then once they got to the royal burial grounds, once again, a surprise awaited them. The royal heir stopped the party in their tracks and directed the bier to the city graveyard. There the body was lowered into a plot in an unmarked section where there were no gravestones to mark the names of the people who were buried and no one came to visit. From a distance, the prophet mentor Isaiah looked on and blessed the new king in the name of the one whose name had just been sanctified. In other words, this rise of Chizkiyahu was a revolution, and it began from the moment that his father died and the way he managed the burial. And so they point these pieces out, and we notice now in terms of the text itself, it says, Vayihi b'shnat shalosh lohoshea ben Ela melech Yisrael, that it was in the third year of Hoshea. This is before the um, the exile of the northern kingdom. We're stepping back a little bit in history. Malach Chizkiyahu ben Achaz Melech Yehuda. Chizkiyahu ascended the throne. Now, actually, it's not in the third year of Hosea's reign. It's actually in the third year after Hosea began his rebellion against Ashur, and as we talked about before, was trying to rule not as a vassal king, but as an independent king. And this is as the Mitzudat David points out. He was 25 years old when he began to reign. For 29 years, he ruled in Yerushalayim. And the, his mother's name was Avi Batzchaya, and it was Avi Batzchaya. She actually had a more royal name, which we find again in Divrei Hayamim, which is Avia Batzcharyahu. That's it. Now, fascinating though, Vayas Hayashar Bene Hashem. He did what was good in the eyes of God. Now, when we say Ayashar Bein Hashem, it's not just that he did good, but there's immediately, we're trying to think about his father. And so if you went back briefly to, to Perak Tetzayin, Pasuk, um, Pasuk Bet, it says there, when we talk about Achaz, 
בן עשרים שנה אחז במלכו, אחז was 20 years when he reigned, this is again חזקיהו's father, ושש עשרה שנה מלך בירושלים, and for 16 years he ruled in ירושלים, ולא עשה הישר בעיני השם אלוקיו כדוד אביו. And he didn't follow in the way. So right after we end with one era of a king who didn't follow in the way, now we have the era of the king who does follow in the way. And that contrast is meant is not something we should just skip along the way. Not only that, but rather we go a step further. Rather what he did is he did what was right like David HaMelech did. Interestingly, the Abarbanel says that's, an, that's a new phrase. We've had kings doing wrong. We've had kids, kings doing right. We've never had a king doing right just like David HaMelech. And so the Abarbanel says that none of them actually reached this level of chasidut in Yerat Shamayim, of piety and awe of heavens, except for Chizkiyahu. And in that sense, David went ahead and David was a step beneath him because David sinned when it came to the question of Batsheva, of that horrific case with Batsheva. Chizkiyahu never sinned in that kind of sin. And the Rabag fi- follows in the same kind of idea. And even later on when we have, by, or I'm sorry, earlier we talked about Asa, Yashar Ben Hashem Kedavid Aviv, which was back in Perak Tedvav, but it not said, never said Kechol, completely like David Aviv did. And in this fact, when we look at how the things he did, we start having a list of those things. Who is Sirat Abamot? He removed the altars that were in the, you know, the private altars that were around Israel. All along, if you remember, these private altars had remained. Vishibar et hamatzivot, and the various, um, they weren't idols, but the various uh, monuments to Av- Avodah Zarah, he destroyed. V'charat et, et ha-asherah, and he cut down the Asherah. Interestingly, by saying the Asherah, it suggests that there was a Asherah that had a unique kind of status within Klal Yisrael. The, um, the Dat Mikra actually s- suggests that what he did is that there must have been an Asherah that was established in a very, very public place that was known as the the most prominent national Asherah itself. And he actually, he ground up the Nechash HaNechoshet, the bronze snake, Asherah Samoshe, that Moshe Rabbeinu had made. This goes back, if you recall, to Bamidbar, Chaf Aleph, Sukim Dalef, Tetet. Ki Ad Hayamim HaHema, because up until those days, B'nai Yisrael mekatrim lo. The Jews were actually worshiping it. They were offering incense offerings. Vayikra lo nechushtan. And he called it nechushtan. Says Rashi that this is lashon bizayon. It's a, a very demeaning term to call it. Nechushtan is a diminutive. It's the little bronze thing. It's not anything real. Now, these... Um, amazing things that he did are actually detailed in much greater um, specificity in Divrei HaYamim Bet, which I also shared with you as one of the documents. And I, again, I'm not going to go through all of Divrei HaYamim Bet because it's three prakim of it. But if you do have it, I'm going to bring it on screen as well. If you do have it, let's get a look at. I did highlight certain phrases to help us move through the text. And so starting in Perek Chavtet, it says, just like in the first verse, Yechizkiyahu Malach, ben 25 shana, ben 29 shana, he was 25, he reigned for 29 in Yerushalayim, and his mother's name was Aviyah Bad Zechariah, as I mentioned before. Now in that very first year of his reign, Pasuk Gimel 3, Bechodesh HaRishon, in Chodesh Nisan, Patach et Altot Beit Hashem ve'yechazkem. He opened up the doors of the house of the Beit HaMikdash and he repaired them. And he brought all of the Kohanim and all of the Leviim. And if you look in Pasuk, hey, Vayomer lahem shema'uni alvim, and he told them, listen, atayit kadshu vekadshu et Beit Hashem elokei avoteichem. Now go ahead, 
sanctify yourselves and the house of Hashem and the Beit HaMikdash, and bring out all of the filth, all of the Avodah Zarah that was brought into this sacred place. And he continues by explaining what happened, how terrible the people were beforehand. They'd closed off the Beit HaMikdash. They had not done what they were supposed to do. Hashem was angry at Yehuda and Yerushalayim, if you remember. And he went ahead and he, and he um, handed them over to their enemies and they fell. And he continues and he says, don't, don't pause in any way. And then we talk about the Levim getting up and doing what they needed to do. And in Pasuk Tetvav, they went ahead and they got all the Levim and the Quaning together. They sanctified themselves. And they came together to start cleansing, and cleansing in the sense of from Tum'ah, purifying the Beit HaMikdash. The Quaning came in. And then, ve'achelu ba'achad l'chodesh harishon l'kadesh u'veyom shmona l'chodesh ba'u le'ulam Hashem. And on the eighth day of the month, of the first month, they got to the ulam of Hashem, they got to the building, ve'yikadeshu et beit Hashem li'amim shmona, and they went ahead and they sanctified this building for eight days, ve'yom shisha asar l'chodesh harishon k'chodesh. Uh, Kilu, and it was on the 16th day of the first month that they were finished with their job. Now, if you think about the months and where we're at, we're in the middle of Nisan. This is already in Pesach when this is happening. Chizkiyahu continues in Pasuk Chav, Vayeshkem Chizkiyahu HaMelech, Vayasof et Sarei Ha'ir, Vayal Beit Hashem, and then he brought everyone together to the Beit HaMikdash. And they brought the Korbanot. And in Pasuk Chav Bet, Vayishchatu HaBakar, Vayikablu HaKonim Et Adam, and they and they shechted the, um, the the animals, and they get and they collected the blood by and they sprinkled it on the mizbeach as they were supposed to. and they shechted the rams by They did the same thing, sprinkling the blood by and then they shechted the um, lambs by In other they began the service of the Beit Hamikdash all over again. And in Pasul Chavzayin, Vayomer Chizkiyahu lahalot ha'ola la'mizbeach, and Chizkiyahu gave the command to bring the korban ola onto the mizbeach. Uveit ha'chel ha'ola ha'chel shir Hashem v'chatzotzrot v'al yedei klei David melech Yisrael. And when that began, then the, the singing that was part of the service of the Beit HaMikdash began, together with all of the instruments that David HaMelech had created. V'chol ha'kahal mishtachavim, and all of the people bowed down. And the people and the singers were singing, and the ones who were blowing the trumpets were blowing them. All of it was happening until the Ola was finished. Then the next parak, Chizkiyahu did an amazing thing, and that was that he brought. He sent a note, he sent letters or messengers to all of the Jewish people. Now, all of the Jewish people in this case is Yisrael and Yehuda. He's inviting the Northern Kingdom to come. Vigam igrot ketav al Ephraim u'menashe. And he also sent out these letters to Ephraim and Menashe. Ephraim and Menashe in the sense is the royalty or the, or the, or the leadership of the North who were still there. Lavo levet Hashem Yerushalayim lasot Pesach l'Hashem Yisrael. And his decision was, come back and let's make Pesach together. In other words, he's inviting a reunification of the Jewish people. Now, the challenge that exists here is this reunification of the Jewish people that he is inviting to take place. If you remember the chronology, it's after already Pesach has passed because the purification of the building was taking place in the first month. So he's inviting him for Pesach, but Nisan... It's not the right time. And we'll deal with that in just a moment. And as a result, he chose to make Pesach in the second month. Now, the second month idea of making Pesach is the source of a great controversy among Chazal and how we are possible to how it's possible to explain that he did Pesach in a second month in Chodesh Iyar. And there are a number of different explanations. All of them have some level of problem associated with them. One is Pesach Sheni. 
that they made Pesach Sheni. The only problem is Pesach Sheni is not meant for a nation. Pesach Sheni is meant for an individual, so that doesn't seem to work. The other possibility, which seems the simplest of all, is what he did was, he was Ma'aber Hashana, he um, created a leap year. And so Nisan gets pushed off one month. And what was Nisan now has a second Nisan to it in essence. The problem with that, the only month we ever create as a leap month is the month of Adar. And so how could he make a second Pesach? There are a number of different problems with this. There's some interesting articles. There was um, one I'm trying to get a hold of that was printed in Hatsofen 1981. And I have yet to get it. I've been, I've been searching all over to try to get it. But the basic premise of the article, I've seen it referenced. So I know his basic punchline of it was that Chizkiyahu was willing to do something that was wrong for the purpose of the unification of the people. Now, why is it so important that he made a second Pesach? Because if you remember, or a second, he made a Pesach in the second month. Because if you remember, one of Yeravam's innovations to separate the Northern Kingdom from the Southern Kingdom was not just the calves that he had established and not just the guards which he put on the borders, but Yeravam also did a recalculation of the months. And so the Northern Kingdom was one month off of the Southern Kingdom. And therefore, when they would celebrate Sukkot, it was the month after we celebrated Sukkot. Their Tishrei was our Cheshvan. By Chizkiyahu adding in this extra month, what he's doing is he's not only enabling the people of the South to celebrate Pesach after this purification of the Beit HaMikdash takes place, but he's reunifying the two kingdoms in terms of what the month is. They now have calendars that are in sync, and the people of the North are going to be coming South to the Beit HaMikdash and what they had assumed all along was Chodesh Nisan, because they were a month behind, and we had assumed already it was the month of Iyar. So Chizkiyahu did this, he bore the blame for this, and we see this within Chazal as one of the possibilities. Ki lo yachlu lasot beitahi, says the Pesach in Gimel, they weren't able to make Pesach at the appointed time, because the Beit HaMikdash wasn't ready yet. It wasn't sanctified. And people weren't there. And as a result, and the messengers went out with the letters from the king and his officers in all of the northern and all of the southern kingdom, as had been commanded by the king, B'nai Yisrael, and it was a commandment to the Jewish people. It wasn't to Yehuda. It wasn't to the people of the north. It was the Bnei Yisrael, Jews. Shuvu el Hashem elokei Avraham Yitzchak v'Yisrael. Come back to the God of Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yisrael. Notice he's using that terminology of Yisrael again. Because he's talking to the Bnei Yisrael. He wants to say this is a unifying call. Vayashov el hapleita hanisharet lachem mikaf malchei Ashur. And so that he may be able to return those of you who are left after the exile of the north. Don't be stubborn. Give in to God. And come back and God's anger will be turned away. And interest, and it happened. And in fact, Pasuk Yud Gimel, Ve'asfu Yushalayim, Am Rav Lasot El Chag HaMatzot B'chodesh HaShenei, Kahal, L'rob Mod. And they came to celebrate Pesach in the second month. A very large number of people. Vayakumu v'yasiru et ha-mizbachot asher b'yirushalayim. You remember, in Pasuk Dalet, in our text, in Malachim Bet, it says, Hu hesir et ha-bamot. He removed the private altars. What is saying here? He took the private Mizbachot that were even in Yerushalayim. If you remember, we talked about his father had established Mizbachot in Yerushalayim, and all of the altars that they used for incense. And he threw them all into Nachal Kidron. Nachal Kidron is the valley at the bottom of Ir David. 
Now, part of that process was not just removing Avodah Zaram, but creating again the central place of worship in the Beit HaMikdash. When his father Achaz had established altars, and when people had private bamot in, pre in previous um, eras, what it did was it obviated for them the need of appearing in Yerushalayim, of having that central focal point of the Beit HaMikdash. Chizkiyahu was trying to overturn that and bring it back. And they brought the Korban Pesach, and again, it keeps on emphasizing, Pasuk Tetvav, Lachodesh Hasheni, it's in the second month. In other words, we're not letting up, even though Chizkiyahu did this, the text is not leaving him alone. It's still calling it the second month. It's not calling it Nisan. It's calling it the second month. Okay, and however, there were many people who hadn't been purified. There were many people of the northern tribes. They weren't, they weren't totally purified, but there is an issue of being able to eat the Korban Pesach if the majority of the tzibur, the majority of the community, is still not tahor. It's a similar situation, if you recall, that is a famous question of why, for example, at Hanukkah, we had to wait for that vial of oil that they found because because they could have used an impure oil itself. Why did they wait specifically for a pure oil when there is mass tum'ah, it should be permitted. Nevertheless, nevertheless, when it came to Hanukkah, they didn't want to do anything less. When it came to the Pesach of Chizkiyahu, we made exceptions because there was a, a bigger piece to attach to it. And then Divrei Amim 31, and there's much more, obviously, that all of the people then went back to the cities of Yudah, and everyone went home after the spiritual experience uh, and the Beit HaMikdash, and they went home and they destroyed any remnant of the Avodah Zarah that, ex that existed, and they all came back. And Chizkiyahu then divided up the Kohanim and the Levim the way they were into their necessary groups. And to go ahead and to hodot ulahalel to provide again to to serve and to provide the um, the praise to God in the in the camp of, of Hashem. And in addition to all of that, he continues, and we talk about other things that he continues to do. And ultimately, at the end of that parak of a chol ma'aser achal b'avodat beit alokim of a Torah v'mitzvot. And we talk about all of these things that Chizkiyahu did throughout Yudan, throughout the north, that he did on behalf of the service of, in the Beit HaMikdash, and also regarding education. Chizkiyahu is credited with making sure that people learn Torah to the extent that he threatened their lives if they didn't learn Torah. And the Chazal talk about the fact that Midan Vad Be'er Sheva, everyone knew, even small children knew the most complex laws regarding Tumah and Tahara during the time of Chizkiyahu. And they prospered. This is the background on what Chizkiyahu is doing at this very same time when we're reading in Pasuk Dalid a summary. It really comprises just uh, in one sentence, three prakim in Sefer Divrei Ayamim Bet. And in fact, one more document, just to go back actually to one more document that I did share with you. It's a little more complicated. It's a lot smaller in terms of the print and I apologize for it. This is from Harav Yitzchak Levi, who was one of the, um, one of the Roshay Yeshiva, Yeshivot Yeshivat Haritzion. He also is a wonderful uh, master of Tanakh. And he gave, he wrote, uh, this actually is on a, uh, you can download it, I gave the URL. It's actually from Parshat Lech Lecha, he gave the Sheur. But he talks about all of the things 
that Chizkiyahu did in his lifetime. And he talks about Tichat Daltot Beit Hashem. You notice this right here. Okay, that he opened up the doors of the Beit HaMikdash and he purified it in the Chanukat and the Chanukat HaMikdash and his re-sanctification of the, of the Beit HaMikdash. That took place in his first year, in the first month in office. The Korban Pesach was the second month in office. So Chizkiyahu's transformation of the Jewish people began immediately. There was no pause, which provides additional backup for what we had been talking about from that piece of reading that we had from Yoel bin Nun and from bin Yaman Lau and how they describe what happened. Chizkiyahu did it because he was the Talmud Muvak of Yeshayahu Navi, his relative, his first cousin, three times removed. And in fact, if we go even a step further, when we talked about the Nachash and the Hushtan, talking about the bronze ser serpent, so they have that piece as well. That bronze serpent, he went ahead and he talks about, it's the bottom of page 113, for as long as anyone can remember, a bronze snake mounted on a pole that hung in the royal courtyard. Tradition held that this was the snake that Moses himself had cast at God's command during the plague of serpents in the wilderness. Quoting the piece from Bamidbar, and then to the next page. For hundreds of years, the statue had been kept by the temple priests. Now, a century after the temple was built, the young king decided to crush the bronze statue into powder. One could imagine the reaction of the priests and the people at this defiant act. The people had looked at the ancient handiwork of Moses himself as an ancient legacy and a, destruct, and a testimony to the nation's continuity. Because if you think about it, it's, it's one of these great symbols. The Radak talks about it here in this Pasuk. Radak says this is just like the Tzentzenet Man, like the, uh, the container of the manna that had been kept next to the Aron. It's, a, it's one of those things that testifies to the historiosity, the truth, and the protection. Suddenly, Chizkiah ordered the destruction of his legacy. Encouraged by Isaiah, he did not fear public opinion. The smashing of the bronze serpent symbolized the obliteration of all cult worship, all ritual that was not in the service of God of Israel. Even icons that had endured for centuries would no longer be tolerated in the wake of Ahaz's idolatry. While Chizkiah's burial of Ahaz may have first been perceived by some as the result of a private dispute between father and son was now clear, the king would, no, would not tolerate his father's way. A Syrian ritual worship would no longer endure in Yerushalayim. All of this took place and he also, then it talks about removing the shrines. It's, it's worthwhile to read this. And there is one more thing that there is a famous piece about the Gemara Sachim, and this is the bottom of page 115 in this piece and continues, talks about the fact that Chizkiyahu, he was Gonez, the Sefer of there was a There was a, a book which contained cures for all maladies, for all disease. And Chizkiyahu put it away and explains the reason why Chizkiyahu did it, and this is, it's based on Chazal, what, what um, Benny Lau and Yol Bin Nun talk about. It was, it was done in order to make people more reliant on God. Uh, he also quotes there, though, just to be clear, he quotes the Rambam, they quote, they quote the Rambam, and talking about, this is not talking about regular medicine today, the medicine has to be used, it's, uh, the Rambam was, has a very strong piece. So having said all of those things, just to back to our Pasu, yeah, Barry, First of all, if, if he uh, intercalated that month, he's got to do the reverse at some point. Do we learn when, that he, when he does that? No, he, you don't have to. You don't have to do a reverse. Alone. Excuse me. You don't have to do a reverse, just like in a regular leap year, because if you remember, the Jewish calendar is eleven days um, shorter than the solar calendar. 11, 12, or thirteen days, depending on the year. Um, so it's about 11 days. So we lose 11 days on the solar calendar every year. As a result, over the course of three years, we're a month behind, more than 30 days behind. Seasons are the one thing, the reason why the Jewish calendar is not a lunar calendar. They just had the new year of the lunar year last week, I think. Um, we are a combined lunar solar calendar. We have an obligation that Pesach takes place, B'chodesh Aviv in the spring month. And so we always have to do it. Now, nowadays, we have a fixed cycle. In these days, it wasn't a fixed cycle of when to add a leap year. It was they would calculate and say, okay, when are we going out of the wrong season? 
You know, uh, we aren't in a leap year this year, but I have a feeling with a year like this, with the weather we have right now, Chazal would have probably added an extra Adar. Okay, because uh, I'm not sure what Nissan is going to look like. Okay, even in Yerushalayim, they had snow this past week. Okay, so as a result of all of that, it was it was discretionary of when to do it, as long as they followed the guidelines. So if they add an extra month, it just means that it's going to be a couple of years before they add on an extra Adar again. I mean, they, in other words, the 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 uh, next real leap year, they would have to skip a year. Which mean well, remember there weren't fixed leap years. That that's my point. That's if they were fixed, it wouldn't okay. matter. If there, well, if there were fixed leap years, you'd be skipping a leap year. Because there are no fixed leap years, it may be a longer period of time between the leap year that Chizkiyahu did and the next leap year. Now, again, it's there's this machloket, and it's a famous machloket of exactly what he did. And the problem, by the way, with calling it a leap year, which is what I'm, uh, the explanation that I'm hanging on to a little bit more in this case, is because it keeps on referring to it as Chodesh uh, Hasheni. Uh, Yaf, if you're speaking, I don't know if Yaf, I don't know if you, okay. So when you talk about Chodesh Hasheni, it sounds like it's ER and not Nisan. Right? Why aren't we calling it Chodesh Arishon again? Um, so they, there's no perfect answer to it. And the Chazal weren't 100% in agreement on it. There's a Machloket in the Chazal, but it does work. In terms of Pshat, it seems to be the simplest halachic response or or with the least violation of halachic approaches seems to be that issue that he did. Now, we've made it, by the way, all the way up to Pasuk Dalit. So I just want to be clear, we're all, and we're moving along at a, at a clip, okay? Slow clip. Slow clip. Bahashem elokei Yisrael batach. He trusted in God. And there was no one like him. No one before him. And in essence, what it means is that no one was after him like that. He was, a, he was sui generis in terms of his commitment and his faith in God itself. Now, Malbim and the Barbanel say, by the way, when it says there was no one like him, it means there was no one like him specifically when it comes to being in Amuna. The Radak notes, by the way, it says there was no one like him, Bechol Malche Yehuda. Now, Malche Yehuda is important to note because David and Shlomo were not Malche Yehuda. David Amalek and Shlomo Amalek were Malche Yisrael. They had all of the nation. And so it, it, we're not diminishing David and Shlomo, but since the point of the revolt, we're saying that no one else was like him. Now, this is actually um, where we have that famous medrash. I mentioned it earlier in Sanhedrin, Sadi Dalit, in the name of Rabbi Yitzchak Nafcha. Chovel ol shel sancherim b'nei shemano shel chizkiyahu. Okay. That ultimately the yoke of, of sancherim will be destroyed because of the oil of Chizkiyahu, says the Gemara. What was it? Shahiyad dolek bevatei kinesiyot vatei midrashot. That the oil that was that was burning in, in shuls and in the base medrashes, Masa, what, did, what was going on in Chizkiyahu's time? Na'atz cherev al petach beit midrash. They, would, they took a sword and they put it into the ground right in, at the doorway of the beit midrash. Ve'amar, and Chizkiyahu put out a, a command. Kol mi no osek bataram, Anyone who isn't learning Torah is going to get stabbed by this sword. But Kumi Dan Vad Bersheva Velomatsu Ama Aret me me Givat Van at Vad Anti Anti Paris Velo Tinok, the Tinok at Shaloyo Bikin Bilhot to Mavatara. And they checked all throughout Eretz Israel. There was no illiteracy, but not only was there no illiteracy, there was nobody who didn't know the most complex issues of halacha that could possibly be. So this is Chizkiyahu's reforms. Vayidbak Bahashem. And he was Dovek. He, he, he cleaved to God. He is the only one that Dat Mikra says that we don't talk about Dvekut Bahashem in an explicit way as we have here, except with Chizkiyahu. 
Lo sar me acharav, he never turned away from God. Vayishmor mitzvotav asher tziva Hashem et Moshe. And he kept all of the mitzvot that had been commanded to Moshe. Vayashem imo, and God was with him. Bechol asher yetzei yaskil, and everything he went to do, he did with seichel. Yaskil is in seichel, it's the same shorish, obviously. And he did it with hatzlacham, with success. Vayimrod bemelech ashur, Velo Avado, and he rebelled against the king of Ashur and he didn't serve him. Now, if you remember back in Pasperic Tet Zion, Ahaz, his father, had been an Evid to Melech Ashur. In fact, if you remember the terminology there, was a very strange terminology that he used. He said about himself, Pulling back because of the design. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to find it. Oh, apologize for a second. He said, I am your servant and your son. And if you remember also, then we said that if you look at servant and son, the inverse of servant and son is Avinu Malkeinu. That in essence, he's turning, he was turning at that point to Tiglat Pileser the third and saying, I'm your servant and your son, you are my father and my, my master. In that kind of sense, now we're saying that he rebelled. He wasn't below Avado, he's saying, I'm not your servant anymore. That's the simplest answer of it all. The Dat Mikra says what really happened is he stopped sending him his tributes that needed to be sent. Now, there is a very difficult situation in history itself at this time. And there is, there is some challenge that's taking place. Uh, and there's some contradictions between the uh, historical record and there's a tremendous amount of the historical record, again, uh, from the kings of Assyria especially when we talk about the era of Sargon and we talk about the, the era of Sanacherev, they left a lot of, of records and we have many of them. And this, and the question is when precisely did this rebellion take place? It appears that this rebellion may have taken place after Sargon's death. I sent you also an art, uh, a chapter from the Ben Sasson history one of the best brief histories of uh, Jewish history, which was done on an academic basis, was the one that was done by Ben Sasson. Um, it's, a, it's a small little volume, okay? It's uh, about that thick, okay? And it was put out, it's, uh, it was put out by, it was published by Harvard. The original was in Hebrew, they translated it from Hebrew. And, what, and Ben Sasson, who was a very significant historian of himself, what he did is he, he brought together the major historians of each of the eras of Jewish history. It goes, uh, it starts from pre-Tanakh, you know, and up to when they call about the, the modern era, the modern era is up until the establishment of the state of Israel. And this section was done by Chaim Tadmor. Chaim Tadmor was not only a, a professor at, Bar at Hebrew University, Chaim Tadmor is also has written extensively on this. He is one. He is the editor or the co-editor, even on the Anchor Bible series, on on the Second Kings and things. You know, if you want to have the historian, the secular historian, he's Jewish, but he's a secular historian on this era. Tadmor is pretty good. Now, Tadmor, I sent you from the tenth chapter of Sasson, talking about this rebellion. It seems to be that what's happening here is there was Assyria is the the great empire. Assyria had conquered, if you recall, the uh, Babylonian Empire. The, at the same time, Egypt was a major power, but Egypt was also going to be, was in the process of being overthrown by the Ethiopians or the Nubians of Ethiopia. And so e Egypt is undergoing transformation. Assyria, as a result, is on the rise. And yet, there occurs when these kinds of rebellions occur, um, the Assyrians begin to respond. 
And in one of their responses, what happened was that um, Sargon went out and Sargon went to battle and he was killed in battle. But not only was he killed in battle, his body was never recovered, which was the ultimate defeat that could ever be. At the very same time, the Egyptians had been overthrown by the Ethiopians and they're trying to figure out what to do now. The Assyrians are trying to figure out what, what to do to make it even more complicated. And Yeshayahu Anavi talks about him. There is a new Chaldean king from Bavel. Bavel rises up against Ashur as well. Merodach Baladan is his name. Yeshayahu Anavi talks about him as well. And all of these things are coming to, into play at the very same time. And apparently, what Chizkiyahu chooses to do is a very logical move. He throws in his support, he, he throws in his, uh, his army together with the Egyptians, together with the Babylonians, and they and begin a rebellion against the Assyrians. All of these are things that are happening. There are a lot of docu documents to the sense there is some real questions about whether or not Yeshayahu was in favor of this or not. We're not 100% sure of all of this. Um, and there's a lot more that we could go into about it. But this merit, this rebellion begins. Um, and we see that who he cut up sorry, and at this point, Chizkiyahu went against the Philistines, Ad Aza Vet Guleha, moving to the sea to Aza, Mimidal Notrim Ad Ir. He goes or Irmitzar, and he goes ahead and he conquers cities within what we'll call the Gaza Strip, what was the Philistine territory. Okay, and, and it was in the fourth year of ben It was now the seventh year of the time of Hoshea ben Ela since that rebellion. Melech Yisrael, Allah shall Maneser, Melech Ashur al Shomron, shall Maneser rose up and he came against Shomron by Yatzarla and he placed a siege. This is a repeat of what we've already heard. And the reason why it's repeated is because it also gives us context to Chizkiyahu and all of his actions. And he placed it under siege for three years. And this took place in the sixth year of Chizkiyahu, the ninth year of Hosea. And he resettles the people across the way. Remember, this was only a portion of the people of the north. It wasn't all of the 10 tribes. We've talked about this already for two weeks, that the rest of the people who remained, either some of them had actually gone south to escape. Some of them remained. Many of them assimilated. We have actually now, as I mentioned last week, there's some uh, genetic proof, apparently, that they made that of this assimilation with the people, the Gerei Arayot of the Kutim, would come in, the Samaritans of today. Because of all of the things that they had done. Now, here we notice already that we have this, okay, this kind of rebellion that's taking place. If you look, for example, just a couple of small points which are important to note, Vayil Kiduha is in plural. So Aaron Marcus, in his sefer called Katmoniot, it was printed many years ago. Uh, it was printed so many years ago that Rabbi Mishkin had referred it to me. Okay, Rabbi Mishkin, not only was Rabbi Mishkin, Rabbi Mishkin Zal for many years, but Rabbi Mishkin also was very much up on the, the historians of, of his era. Okay, and he's, Aaron Marcus notes, he says that Belikaduha means that, if you remember, Shalmaneser had started the siege, but he died before the actual exile. It was Sargon II who took the Jews off into exile. And that's why it's in a plural form. All of those things take place. And now what happens? 
ובארבעה שנה למלך חזקיהו עלה סנחרב מלך אשור על כל ערי יהודה הפצורות בית פסק. סנחרב קאמס. סנחרב is the son of Sargon. Sargon had died in battle. Sanherev is trying to recapture after these rebellions had taken place. Sanherev is part of the exile story. All of these things are taking place. And in 701, he, we know that he went against Yehuda. We're not sure if his records agree with our records or not. There is question on that. Why he went to, to, the, to war, Ben Sasson talks about that. You can even read more about it, but this was his way to try to consolidate all of his power. And it, when he went to war, and Chizkiyahu sent to Sancherev, who was based in Lachish. Now, Lachish was a Jewish city, and Lachish was a city that was a major fortified city that had been captured by Sancherev. And in fact, we have evidence of this in two places. If you want to see the panels of victory of Sancherev's capture of Lachish, go to the Oriental Institute. If you want to see proof of those panels, go to the excavations at Tel Lachish, and you see the way it was captured we have evidence of it in the archaeology of today. He sends him in Lachish. So now we need to understand that Sancherev has been very successful. The northern king, kingdom has been exiled. Sancherev is down. He's, he's recapturing cities. And he writes, Chatati shuv me'alai. He says, I've sinned. Please go away. Et asher titen alai says, whatever you want, I will give you. And the king of Ashur placed over Chizkiyahu, the king of Yehuda, a tax. He said, I want 300 kikar kesef, and I want 30 kikar zahav. Now, a kikar, just to give you an idea, it weighs about 70 pounds. Okay. So if you start doing your math, okay, 300 kikar, 300 times 70 is 21,000 pounds of silver. Ushloshim kikar zahav, okay, is again, we're talking about uh, 30 times 70. So if I have my right, if my number's right, that's 2,100 pounds of gold. This is not a small tax that was placed on them, taking it one step. But at the same time, Vayiten Chizkiyahu at kol ha-kesef ha-nimtza v'et ha-shem. So Chizkiyahu gave him all of the silver that was in the Beit HaMikdash, the treasuries, Uvaltzot Beit HaMelech, and also the treasuries of the king. In other words, he wiped out all of the storehouses. And at that moment, Chizkiyahu went ahead and he stripped the doors of the Beit HaMikdash, which had been um, plated with precious metal, but he needed that metal to be able to pay off the tribute to Sanachir. Now, there's a real interesting thing that's taking place here for just a moment. If you look, the Umnot, by the way, I'm sorry, the, um, are, are, we're, we're not sure what the Umnot are. According to the Tzudot, the Umnot are the columns that, that had been uh, plated in precious metal, according to Targum Yonatan and Skupaya, which are the, um, the doorways that had been plated as well. But what's fascinating about this piece is if you look, the first, in the Pasuk before, we talk about Chizkiyahu, we refer to him as Chizkiyahu Melech Yudah. Then when we hit Pasuk Tetvav, Vayiten Chizkiyahu. Pasuk Tetzayin, Kitzatz Chizkiyahu. Asher Tzipah Chizkiyahu Melech Yudah. What's going on here? 
the negotiations between Sancherev and Chizkiyahu are royal negotiations. But then the humiliation of having to empty out his treasuries, having to undo some of the things that he had done, he's just Chizkiyahu. He's been demeaned to that level. And then when we talk about who had built things up, the one who had built it up was Chizkiyahu HaMelech. So plain Chizkiyahu was stripping the plating that King Chizkiyahu had put in place. This is the, the humiliation of what's taking place at this time. And talking about time, we are now at the end of our time. I knew this week we weren't going to make it the whole way through. So I'm, this is not a surprise, but next week we're going to pick it up. And I want to pick it up next week with one of the handouts that I gave you, and that's specifically the parak from Yeshayahu Yud Aleph, which is a very important parak, which is talking about Mashiach. It includes those sentences that we are very, very familiar with of the wolf li living with the lamb, etc. That Nevoav Yeshayahu, which, according to the Malbim, was talking about Chizkiyahu HaMelech. We'll stop here. And I wish everyone a wonderful day, and it should be a good day. Yaffa, yes. I can't hear you, Yaffa. Wait, is it me? Hold on a second. Uh, uh, not Yaffa, there's something with your... There's something with your... We still can't hear you. You're not muted. You are not muted. It's your microphone. Can you oh, hear me now? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. Okay. Um, yeah, first I want to thank Jim and Meira Mainzer for sponsoring today's sheer in memory of my daughter, Shafi Huddas. Very touched, the whole family is touched. And if I can go into the sheer for a minute, when it talks about um, the expulsion of, of Yisrael by Melech Ashur in Pasuk Yud Beis, it actually gives the reason that it was because Hashem by Yavruot Brito, right? Right. And that was a disaster happening, and it gives the reason that it was a, a violation against the Kodesh Barucho. And here we see Chizkiyahu doing everything right. And where is the godly reason for this terrible disaster that's visited upon them? So we will see that it's not a terrible disaster. Ah. We'll see ultimately, if you remember the rest of this story, is when Sancherev lays siege to Yerushalayim in the end, HaKadosh Baruch Hu saves Yerushalayim. Okay, that he will be saved. Um, there is, there, there are some issues with Chizkiyahu HaMelech as well. In other words, Chizkiyahu was in his first year, and just to go back to um, that, that uh, chart which I had, it'll take me a moment to, to bring it up. If you can just bear with me just a moment. What we're talking about is, the, first of all, um, he did all of these things right. This is the upper charts. And what's happening, Shomron was captured by Shalmaneser, Melech Ashur, then Ashdod was by Sargon, and uh, then Amalek and Plishtim are destroyed. We see this is also what is taking place, that this is part of what Chizkiyahu did. And then he makes the covenants with Mitzrayim which is not a simple act that he did. Now we understand politically why he did it, because the Mitzrayim, and this is, this is covered in Yeshayahu, Mitzrayim um, were enemies of his enemy, which made, him, which made them natural allies, and they were a major empire. But Mitzrayim is gonna be the one who you can't rely on again. And every time we rely on Mitzrayim, we find ourselves in trouble, just as if we found ourselves in Ashur. And that's taking place also at the same kind of time, the same time frame of that, of that year where things are happening and things are beginning to turn the wrong way. Thank you very much. There is, I, I have to emphasize one, once more that there is the, the history, the, the secular history of this has a lot of things in common. What you find in that article from Tadmor, the chapter from Tadmor that's very interesting, is that not only does it have a lot in common, but Tadmor admits that there's things that diverge between the biblical text and the text of the steels of Sancherev. And yet at the very same time, he says, it's not a big issue because many times when you have the retelling of the same item by two different parties, 
you can have them, you can have very different conclusions. And so he even points to an earlier time where Sancheriv had actually met an element of defeat, but the way they phrased it was to, as if it wasn't a defeat. And the same thing could be what they, what's going to happen with it, with Sancheriv in Yerushalayim, that there's a lot, of, lot, in, lot in common, even the numbers of the money that was given to them. There's a lot in common in those numbers, so it seems to support. And those things that are different, okay. So we, so the, the secular history won't support it necessarily, but it doesn't necess, doesn't also doesn't necessarily contradict it. Okay, we'll stop here. And uh, Yafa, as you already said, you you should have nechama from all of us. Amen. And, thank uh, you. And your, your daughter's nechama should continue to have an aliyah. Amen. Thank you so much, Yeshkaya. Thank you. Thank you. Have a happy program. Thank you. Thank you. Book